you have the ID, you are welcome to get a ticket. You come, and if you need any additional tickets, just find me, and I will help you, or contact me by phone or email, and I will help you. So we're really excited to raise awareness, and um, in November we'll be doing an appreciation week as well. So this is awareness, and then in November we'll do an appreciation Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Council, any thoughts? Not on the same question on this review action item. Sure, I'm going to go over it. I would like to make a motion to adopt resolution 218-2014-A, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Cedar Hills, Utah, proclaiming February 24th, March, sorry, February 24th, March 1st, 2014, as the non-traditional student awareness week in Cedar Hills. Second. And the motion has been seconded. Any further discussion? Not let's have a vote. Mrs. Reese. Aye. Mr. Gustus. Aye. Mr. Crowley. Aye. Mr. Gettys. Aye. Mr. Zapala. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you much. And congratulations. Thank you. Let's move on. Um, item number 10. Mr. Bumper, you're presenting on an interlocal agreement between Northwood and Solid Waste. Yes, very much. You have um, Mike Dunn, who had signed up in public comments, wanting to speak on this item. He represents um, not Northwood Solid Waste, but a competitor. Mr. Dunn, you have three minutes. If not, I'll give us your, your address. Go for that. I'm Mike Dunn, <coughs> manager of DTV Transfer Station. switched um, hauling their MSW 
they are direct hauling from uh, Alpine City out to Intermountain Regional Landfill, higher up. And their hauler is ACE uh, Disposal. Currently, tipping rates for North, North Point are $31.50 a ton. And the city tips approximately 36.50 tons per year. Um, we did get a proposal from Intermountain Regional Landfill. You can see their rates. Right now, their rates are $15 a ton uh, tipping fees. That does not include, haul, include hauling. So we would have to negotiate with our hauler, which currently is waste management. We have a couple more years on that contract to find out if they would haul and at what rate they would haul our MSW out to IRL. So the $15 a ton is not include haul. I want to make that clear. Um, they have not calculated that cost yet. Now currently they haul to North Point for us, so they already do haul a certain distance. But IRL is so much further west than currently where they haul, that there would be a, an additional charge. They haven't calculated that yet. Um, Mr. Dunn also gave us a proposal uh, with DCD transfer, and that is in your packets as well. And uh, you can see his, his proposal is $28 a ton, and then he would guarantee that rate for five years. Uh, in addition, one of the issues we have is where do our residents uh, have access to take trash from their own homes? Right now, they can go to North Point Solid Waste, and we have a coupon program here in the city where we allow residents to get two passes to the dump. Each one of those vouchers costs the city $8 each. In the DCD proposal, he would accept those vouchers at seven dollars a piece. So uh, we definitely want to make sure that our residents can take their garbage and their trash you know, somewhere close and they don't have to drive clear out to the higher level. Um, you have the interlocal cooperation agreement in your packet that was presented earlier. Um, there are several cities who have not yet passed this agreement. Is there four who have not yet passed that? <coughs> and so um, I think they're still working through some information just like we are. So I, I wanted to make sure that you had, had this information so that you can make an informed decision. Is there any questions on the proposals? So I'll get it open. If I understand correctly, you don't have all the information you need on the hauling cost associated with IRL, is that correct? For a direct haul from Cedar Hills to IRL, we have not been given the cost for hauling. Okay. Very good. And does DTD include their costs for hauling? DCD, yes. So our hauler is waste management. The distance from here to DCD is the same as from here to North Point. They're, they're within half a mile. One's in Linden and one is in Fort Washington. So it's not really in charge of Yeah, it would be the same. And what's the use of mileage to IRL? Uh, the, I can't remember the, the additional mileage there. And, and it would be a ramp because they have to go that much further out plus. So I don't know their exact distance. So let me ask a question as far as the value we have with North Point currently. Is, is there a dollar value that, you, that we already like, what's our uh, equity, I guess, in, in, in that? Is there something we like really? Liability, that's what I'm talking about. Um, Councilmember Augustus could probably speak a little bit to that since he's probably more aware of it. He sits on the board. I don't know of an exact number that anybody's been able to pinpoint to what city or how much each city's contributed to capital improvements, to liability and all that. I have not seen an exact number. I mean, it's probably something we could derive looking at the number of cities, population, and break it out per capita, look at how much we spend per year. I mean, we could probably get a rough idea, but I don't know if anybody's done that yet. Are we talking tens of thousands of dollars, hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, probably in excess of hundred thousand, I would think. Is that what we would be walking away from if we to go somewhere else. Um, that, to, I believe you would stay still, in the district, obviously. You would stay in the district, but we wouldn't really have access to it. I mean, it would have to stay there. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a difficult thing because our fees, 
the 3150 a ton is based on their operations right now. And this so, is a nonprofit, right? So they're yeah, they're operating as a nonprofit. You know, and the city managers from the northern area I met with uh, uh, Roger, the district manager down there, to talk about what that fee comprises of and, and how we get that fee. You know, if we get if we get proposals, if all the cities get proposals that are less than that that typical fee, how do we get our district to compete with that, or do they need to compete with that? And that's that's a question that's been batted around. Um, Let me ask one question. So, for instance, the tipping fee is set for two full years. Yes. Is that how you at, at the district? Because they do a contract with Allied Waste to take all the waste stream from North Point and they haul it to Tuella. That doesn't include hauling. What, what, yeah, does. what, what, for instance, in the next six months, fuel goes up? You know, from three dollars a, a gallon to six dollars a gallon. Is there a fuel surcharge then added to that? Yes. Point? Yes. And and there. How about in DC, DC's pro proposal? What happens? Is there a fuel, fuel sur surcharge in the uh, fine print? I, I that. Typically, there is. If, if fuel goes over four dollars a gallon for diesel fuel, then there, there's a surcharge, and it's typically built into the contract. I know that that's built into Allied's contract to haul as well. So. Um, I have a quick comment. <clears throat> usually when industry is privatized, and it usually uh, results in lower costs in the long run, and more efficiency, and things like that, I think anything that can be done by something other than a government agency or a government run agency is generally more efficient. And uh, so that that kind of affects my decision slightly, but uh, it seems like there's not enough information to make a decision today. One of the, one of the items that uh, I was reminded of is there are, there are other programs that North Point does provide us. Um, so for instance, they have a hazardous waste uh, collection day twice a year, so people can take their old paint, you know, chemicals, things like that down there. Um, so they, they do that. They provide other things as well. Um, they will take green waste as well. Um, so will Tipanoga Special Service District, and actually we would encourage our residents to take their green waste too, to Tipanoga special service district because it, it's free to dump there if they take the right product they can't take uh, a whole bunch of leaves and grass because that's really hard for them to handle down there but limbs and branches and things like that definitely um, so mr augustus you're our representative on this board do you have any thoughts that you can add to this you know sometimes i like just reading through the agreement again to see if i can get a better idea of like what our investment with north point is and the one thing that I'm kind of looking at right now, it says, whereas from 2008 through the completion of the redesign and retrofit of the district facilities, the district will have invested approximately 5.4 million in district facilities and approximately 1.9 in district equipment to be able to provide solid waste disposal services to member of municipalities and their citizens. So roughly, I mean, that gives us, what, about $7.3 million that we've invested between the member cities. Now, right now, I believe we have about 13 member cities, but a couple of them aren't participating, and there are some other issues that go with that. Um, so I don't know if you take $7.4 million divided by 13 cities, and that kind of gives you an idea of what we've invested over the last few years. I, I think it's based on the waste stream that we take to the, to the district. So I believe Roger told me the number for our city was 6% of the total waste stream. We're, we, don't, we don't take a massive amount. Yeah, or to be a lot more than one. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at that on like a per capita basis or a waste stream percentage. Or, I mean, you have to do something to make it equitable for our city. 6% is still $438,000. I don't see how that's still a decent right. chunk of change. I don't mm -hmm. see how that ever represents money coming back in our pockets, though. So I don't see exactly the orbits of that at this point. But that's something we can look at now. Except that overall, it, it affects the rate that we we'll charge. So. The, the assets that are spent are theoretically to make it more efficient so that the rates go down as that's what I understand. Yeah, because I mean they do have to buy new equipment, like they had to buy a new compactor and new bulldozer this year. And so I mean, we are spending funds from our taxpayers to North Point so that they have the correct equipment to manpower the facilities, the redesign, the access, roads, and all of that. And we pay for those facilities, but we have been paying for them. So 
I don't know. I mean, we do have kind of an investment with North Point, and if we're willing to look at something else, I mean, that seems to be walk away from those capital improvements. Do we anticipate that rates will go down? Uh, no, actually, I think they're probably going to go up because as more cities leave North Point, it puts more of a burden on the rest of the cities. So, unless there's something that changes, I don't see a whole lot of decrease in fees because the economy is constantly kind of going up. I haven't seen any decrease. I'm aware of it. Have you seen anything that would indicate that? When we talked with Roger, I believe the indication was that it was not going <coughs> down and potentially slightly up. Yeah. So, I. Uh, I'm interested, I know you've been spending a lot of time on this, the two of you, I understood your recommendations since you spent most amount of time researching this, but I would like to also see um, IRL's uh, additional charges for you at all. Yeah, that would come from waste management. Or oh, okay, from waste management. Because IRL, they're only going to build facilities. Sorry. So, I mean, yeah, somebody, I mean, we have a couple of choices here. This is this is a very review action item. If someone wants to make a motion, either to approve or table it. Can I touch on Betty's comment for just a second? Um, I am a little concerned about it, and one of my biggest concerns that I keep coming back to, and it's one that we've talked about quite a bit on the board, we've talked about it here in our city council, I know the city managers have talked about it, but it's a pretty lengthy contract term, and it was actually a lot lengthier before we got it knocked down, and I know David really fought for us and got those terms kind of tightened up so that we weren't out quite as far. And I know some of the other cities had some fairly large concerns over that also, and that was one of them that I share with them, is that if we're going out and saying that we're now committed to North Point through the end of what, 2019 is the first term that would expire, I mean, we're in essence committing a future council to be bound by that also. And one of the things I pointed out to the North Point board was that typically when we go out to bond or we do capital improvements within our city, that are to the extent that we have to go either bond or get additional revenue for that, we go to our citizens and say, what do you guys think about this? Because in essence, we're putting them on the hook for future years, and we're binding future councils by doing that. And that's something that I expressed to the board that I was really concerned over is because we're now making agreements that are probably going to outlive our council members. And they really didn't have a good answer for it. Everybody was kind of like, well, yeah, but what else are we going to do? Kind of a thing. And to me, that's a little concerning. I'm glad we kind of tightened it up so that we're not going out as far. I think before it was like 23 or something, but then I knew it's out quite a way. So that's one of the concerns I have is just the length of the contract because it's, it's a decent term. Okay. Thank you. My recommendation is that we table the item until we have uh, numbers back from this management. So are you, are, you, are you making a motion to table it? I move that we table this item until we have numbers back from this management. I'll second that. Okay, motion is been seconded. Any further discussion on this item? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion has been tabled, thank you very much. All right, moving on. So, um, so, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, 
Um, I think that the 40% open rule has a lot to do with safety on the books, on the public trails. Um, spe specifically along the Forest Creek where it can get a little bit, uh, like I guess, claustrophobic back there where there's not like a clear view area through there. Um, however, the, the 11, there's 11 homes that are bordering on Canyon or Canyon Road. Uh, they are not sandwiched in like the ones on Forest Creek, so they would have the open side on the, on the road side, on the west side. So it's kind of a, a different matter there. Uh, would you like to add something? Sure. Else? So I live in a neighborhood um, where this one's affected residents. There are some residents that all live on Sugarloaf, and their backyard backs up to Canyon Road. And right now, they're only allowed to have the open fences. They can't have privacy fences in their backyards. Yet, kitty corner to them, also on Canyon Road, are also residents that have backyards or side yards on Canyon Road, and they have full privacy fences, either final or raw. And so these residents would like to also have the option to have privacy fences, as you can imagine, Canyon Road is very busy, and they would like to have those privacy fences in their backyards. So, in talking with staff, what Chandra mentioned was that there was an ordinance put in place so that way there wasn't this row of privacy fences along trails, which makes complete sense. You don't want you want it to be safe for people who are walking on the trails. Um, so my question was, if we could discuss and propose to the planning commission to look at opening it, the rules or relaxing the rules for those people who live on a trail where there's never going to be an option to have a fence on the other side because they live in this open area. In this case, it's they live on Canyon Road, so there's not going to be a privacy fence on the other side of that trail or even the other side of the street, because the other side of the street is the golf course. Um, David had mentioned that there's also a resident on the west side of Bay Hill who has requested the same thing uh, currently. He has a, an open fence, but with like a privacy fence because it's borders the sidewalk. And residents on Silver Lake Drive that have that same thing where their backyards back up to, I'm assuming it's that uh, canal, isn't it? That's right. Jimmy, is the issue here that um, we've designated basically normally a sidewalk area as a trail yes. as opposed to say Forest Creek and down through Cedar Cedar Ridge and down to Deerfield? We have kind of a real trail there with green spaces on both sides. Right, and behind Sugar Lope, it is an actual paved trail with the yellow lines as well instead of sidewalks. It's, it's the side. trail. Yeah. Yes. And so my recommendation is that we look at that and, and allow these residents to have a privacy fence because it's not going to ever be locked in on another side. So we want to add language specific to that. Now, my question on that is, because there's probably a lot of interpretation involved in that. Um, and as it stands right now, the fencing ordinance, a lot of that can be interpreted by the zoning administrator and the code enforcement, which okay. you still want to leave that language yet. Um, I would like to have the planning commission weigh in on that. As far as, well, I mean, as far as, uh, I guess, interpreting what would be construed, because you probably have to define how open it has to be. How open the, how, oh. How, how far away the fence would have to be, because in Canyon Road case, you have the entire road right. and the golf course, whereas on different instances, you might have a neighborhood road, right. and not as much space between where, where another fence could be, so there could be a definition of it. My opinion would be that we, that we put some parameters around it, because when laws are open to interpretation, then yes. it causes a lot of frustration for people who are interpreting it differently than others, so I, I would like to, to yeah. put some parameters around it. So I mean, really, the discussion tonight is, what do we take and what would you like to recommend the planning commission to look at? Is there a specific language you'd like to see? Uh, so, I mean, please, if there's any questions, I'd love to take some Okay, Council. I mean, Mrs. Mrs. Reese, you asked recommendations that you want to go to the planning commission, right? Yes. And have you articulated those as much as you want? Or Just, not? yeah, any time that there's going to be a considerable amount of space, and whatever we need to define that is between, um, or there can't be a privacy fence on the other side, then I think that we should allow that. Mr. Augustus, you were raising yes. Okay, I don't know, David or Chandler, do you guys know, are the fencing issues also bound in the development agreements or the CCNRs with any particular development east of Canyon Road? The answer is, is no. There was a, memo, a memorandum that uh, we received from our city attorney, I want to say about, I said that, I said that to you, Jenny, and, and, and the mayor. Uh, was it about four years ago? Yeah. Maybe even six years ago. And there's not, there is not an official HOA on that east side that would enforce any other fencing requirements. Now on the west side of the Cedars HOA, there is a Cedars HOA on the west side, but not on the east side. So okay, we can change. What? Can I ask about what about the Red Sons? 
Um, each, each individual subdivision may have their own set of uh, HOA rules, and we'd have to look at those. Okay. So Renaissance may I'm have familiar with this one, so I have to look at this. Yeah. I, I didn't look at uh, the states, but they do, the Taj King, they do run against the Iraq. So in looking at the title, it does not appear that there are CCNRs on this subdivision. Okay, because I was actually on the board of directors for our HOA for three years, and the fencing issues came up every other month, it seemed like. I mean, fencing is a big issue for anybody north of Duck County. Um, and I know with the Cedars West, we're actually bound in the development agreement, which makes it much harder to change than just the CCNRs. We also have language in the CCNRs, but the reason that the Cedars West was actually allowed to be such a high density as it is, is because we're now forced to have open fencing and we have to do wrought iron fencing for the entire subdivision. I mean, we don't have a choice. We can't do privacy, we can't do wood, we can't do anything else. And my understanding was that there was something that prohibited that up there also. They were part of the Cedars HOA, uh, but I think that they disbanded that as part of the HOA. They're not submitted to the same CCNR, so it really only be the ones on Sugar Loaf that were talking about. Yeah, because the houses on the other side of Sugar Loaf yeah. that are in the same development. It's so, just because these guys back up on a trail that they can't. Yeah. Right, and the city can't come in and just override the over the CCRs before the Cedars West Right. Right. But see, I thought because they were ordering either Canyon Road or because of like the trail system, because there was, and I don't know, it's been a couple years since I've dealt with it, but I thought there was something beyond that as to why we couldn't do that. Similar to like a the development agreement, because of the density and back end. Can you know, maybe I can want to get the building agreement for those uh, buildings because it's still part of the seat of development. Uh, but I, I don't know that they're still subject, but I don't think they're subject to the same CCNRs as the seniors. So it really, like I said, everything east of Sugarloaf, that doesn't board back up into that trail, would be able to have privacy density. So, I'm, but I'm, like I said, I'll, I'll check the development agreement. Probably because it's the development agreement, because I know we're bound by the development agreement. Uh, so for part of the seniors, I just want to make sure that we're not overstepping boundaries. Okay. So, Chandra, you've got any recommendations. Anyone else have any recommendations on this? If you like, you want to say something. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm a little bit conflicted. And I don't mind the planning commission looking at this. I think it's going to require driving down there and especially if you can walk the trail and maybe even asking the board some residents back there. I'm just looking at Google Earth and my own recollection of the area. And some things I noticed is that the existing fence, um, because of the way the properties are situated, um, the properties actually go uphill from the side from this spot. So I don't know that a privacy fence is actually going to give that much privacy in this case. Um, I will tell you, Daniel, because I get in those backyards. The backyards are actually, some of those houses go up, but a lot, most of those backyards are free. They, they have a small incline, but not significant. Okay. Um, and I guess, I guess I have a couple of concerns. One is that um, I, I feel that you get from walking on a trail really changes when you have a fence on one side that is a privacy fence. And in this particular situation, what you would get is you would be walking along um, a sheer, probably white fence, very bright with light bouncing off it, next to a road with asphalt with light bouncing off it, and then rocks, and we haven't got any grass plants even there. So it would not make for a very pleasant walking experience. Um, if, on the other hand, we were to change it and put in grass or some trees or something to soften it between the, um, the trail and Canyon Road, that might make me more likely to say, yeah, that would be fine. I just want to make sure that we give residents um, the privacy they want, but also try to accommodate the trail, which is really what we're trying to make happen. I want, I want to have a good experience on the trail there. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is. And then, I'd say, I think from those residents' perspectives, one of the frustrating thing is, if you walk, you know, 50 feet down, you're running into the exact same thing. There are privacy fences on Canyon Road on that sidewalk if you just continue to house it down. 
Yeah. On the opposite side. Which is not a pleasant time to experience either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only question I have is, is, do we know how many residents want this? There's what, 20, 20 homes? No, oh, there's, only, there's only about 11 homes on that screen. Um, on the other side of the city that yeah. are in a similar situation. There is the one bay though that does want it. So, like, even if you pull out, um, you're on the uh, grids. I heard this one. There's a there's a home there that has a privacy fence for just a section of the fence that was put in last summer. I know that they would like to have had a, you know, it's not a privacy fence, it's open fence. So there's one, there's two. Well like so they they put a fence around their whole yard, but only a portion of it is back to against the trail and it's just an open fence. The rest of it's a privacy fence, so it doesn't matter against the trail. You know, since there's something that would be similar to like it's probably have a privacy fence. Okay, so it sounds like we we're making a recommendation to the planning commission. Yeah, back to us. Okay. Thank you. All right. can, can I just make sure that we add in the recommendation that if they're going to change the fence ordinance, they consider landscaping near those trails where they're going to change the fence ordinance. Yes. So they put lots of trees and green spaces between the trail and the street, so it's not just a concrete corridor. We could turn
there are several questions that I have and some recommendations that I have in the end that I would the council to consider uh, to make this process a little bit less of an argumentative process. Um, one question I have for you is, is maybe if you could outline how grandma fees are calculated, how it comes to determine how much to charge someone for a grandma fee, and then how we determine if a grandma request is in the interest of the um, residents or if it is for personal interest that should be charged for. Kind of go through the rules on that and maybe tell us how we distinguish between those two items, whether it's for personal political use or for um, the best interest of the city overall. And uh, I'd like to maybe consider that we document how we determine that so that people know and can determine whether they are asking something that's in the interest of the community or for their personal interest. So those are some items that I want to discuss and maybe we can address them. Well, those are um, broad topics. And I'll say this, that um, the Government Records Access Management Act, often affectionately called GRAMA, because that's the acronym, uh, it, that is that is the open sunshine law, whereby governmental records are made available and accessible to any member of the public. Um, and uh, I guess on the federal level, the federal complement would be the FOIA and uh, Freedom of Information Act. And uh, grandma is, is just a, the Utah equivalent of the it, uh, it does make some uh, legislative distinctions. For the most part, most of the cost of maintaining government records is borne by the, the general uh, uh, tax base, by the general population. But there are uh, small items that uh, are charged to the individual requester. And those, uh, the, the two primary ones are just copy costs and compiling costs. And copy costs is simply the actual cost of making copies. And compiling costs is just the actual cost of gathering the requested records uh, as they ask for them. So very often, the requests are gathering the records fairly simple and ask for something like a, a city audit. Um, that's something that you just go over that. And, and it's also available electronically both on the city website as well as on the state audit website. <coughs> Others uh, require a lot more effort to pick out the information that is requested out of all of the information and that's where the uh, compiling fees get a little higher. Um, one of the, the rules that uh, in Grandma is that the first 15 minutes are free. It doesn't matter what the request is. And so the first 15 minutes are always on the house. Um, if the estimated, uh, act, estimated actual cost, I'll call it, it exceeds $50, then the city is entitled to ask for prepayment of the estimated fee before uh, it begins compiling. This is wise because Cedar Hills, like many other entities in the state, have had people ask for records. They go to the expense of gathering them, and then they say, eh, I'm paying them. And so it's over $50, uh, the, the act allows for uh, prepayment before any action is taken. On the issue of whether uh, a request, a particular request, uh, is, is primarily in the public interest, primarily benefiting the public as opposed to uh, personal, that is an individualized um, assessment with each and every grandma uh, request. I believe it would be wise for the request board to indicate if they felt their request was in the public interest to tip the city off that they ought to consider that. Otherwise, it just might not really uh, make it on radar screen. 
Um, but sometimes requesters do that, and they say, well, I believe this is in public interest. I would ask you to waive uh, the normal charges and fulfill my request for that charge. As a general matter, the city, um, the city regularly charges those compliant fees, and I think that that's probably a good public policy to have because when uh, someone makes a request that is purely in their private interest, um, I don't see why the general taxpayer should pay for that, especially when the requester isn't even from Cedar Hills, which the city receives quite a number of things. And um, so I believe it's probably in the, 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 the public interest to uh, charge the fees that it can as a general rule. The question then comes, must the city charge those fees? Well, Grandma spells out when the city can, it, it, it is authorized to not charge those fees to some folks, yet charge them to others, and uh, primarily benefiting to public interest is one of those. Um, uh, but for the city to just arbitrarily decide you don't have to pay, but you do, then the city would run afoul of constitutional uh, equal protection uh, provisions and would get itself in control. Uh, so that, I think generally that's, that's my assessment. I mean, a couple of places. Very good. So if you could stick around uh, in case we need you again. I'm going to get into the public comments area. So uh, I received a letter from one of our residents who asked if her uh, comments to be read into the public record. Her name's Tanya Edelson. It's for her husband, Brian Edelson, and herself. I'll read that in. And Mr. Cromer, you're on deck. Dear Mayor and City Council members, I wanted to add comments to the public record on behalf of my husband and myself. We cannot attend the council meeting tonight, so I hope that these comments are considered as well. We believe that any grammar request by any party should be assessed a charge for the time and the efforts that it takes the city staff to compile them. The city already provides so much information freely through the website, public meetings, city council agenda packets, and the app that was recently published that we believe any additional information should be processed through grandma appropriately. This takes time and effort through staff and attorneys. The time is, this time has to be financially accounted for somehow. These requests seem to take up a considerable amount of staff time and effort along with attorney time. And as residents, we are concerned about the resources that these requests are taking from other city tasks. We believe that it is prudent for the council to recoup any cost possible for these requests, especially in light of the extreme cases we have seen by one of our residents in the past years. It has become egregious and out of line to expect our city staff members to drop their other necessary duties to respond to these requests. We do not believe that any summary should be prepared for any party in the future of staff emails, weekly tasks, or meetings. This is an unreasonable, this is unreasonable to expect. Thank you very much for your consideration and service to our city. If you have any questions or would like to discuss this further, please contact her. Thank you very much. Mr. Cromart, come up. You've got three minutes. Name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Ken Cromart. I gave this up in the middle of the drive. Former councilman in 2000 and lead researcher for senior citizens for responsible government. An ad hoc group, which uh, has many articles and information at SeabrookHillCitizens.org. My, my comments tonight are just very simple. I just would like to thank um, Councilman Zapala and Councilman Crawley for <coughs> taking the time to sit down and visit with us. Um, we realize that uh, the council is really where the road meets the road. The, the council is the only entity that can vote on the expenditures of the city of Cedar Hills. And not the mayor, not, not the staff, not, not us, certainly, uh, though we've been voting for, for us. Um, and, uh, and so the vote comes uh, to you. Uh, our hope is that um, we have stayed off, tried to stay off of the air stream. We made a grand request on the 1st of October. Uh, 
met with a lot of ridicule and um, harsh comments. We decided to cut that back to approximately a third. Have been constantly in contact with various parties, seeking opportunities to visit the council and try to understand. Thankfully, the mayor um, and council member Jimmy Reese and David Bunker and city attorney sat with us the after Christmas chair, very, very myself. Talk with them. Very, very, very much appreciate that. We believe that talking is the, the best answer. The questions that, that we have are really very simple. Um, I Numerous times a day, we'll sort emails, and it takes all five minutes at the most for many sorts of various kinds. I'm sure many of you have done that in this room. Our question is how can it go from five minutes to 30 hours of that's my credit dollars? We know what it says in the uh, documentation here and the city's uh, agenda that fees and charges for legal review or uh, add classification as to whether they're public or private are borne by the city. That's just simply state law. So five minutes to $30 to $900 doesn't make sense. We've requested the documents as is. We have made it clear in English communications that it is in the public interest. The previous request in 2012 was so, and we, don't, we didn't understand why the attorney was uh, involved at $125 an hour when the state code gives the guidelines and the city recorder, who is usually the records officer, to make those decisions. So we have not posted anything on the website. We have tried to lay low and simply to demonstrate goodwill. And we hope that we won't have to appeal. Uh, we won't have to, but we can continue discussions and hope the city will be inclined to do so. We think that $30,000 spent, and we believe it was much more than that, as much as 160, to collect $766 last time was not in the best interest of the taxpayer. And we wouldn't think that $30,000 to collect $900 probably very much has provided a compromise and was certainly willing to sign up for that. Thank you. Mr. Latter, your turn is. Mr. Phelan, you are on you're on deck. Darren Lauer, 4633 West Hill Park Circle. My shirt still has not faded in eight or nine years. Um, I followed the topic on the forum. I still don't know what the group is after. I wish they would post that. I've appreciated the council members' efforts uh, in trying to define what is truly a benefit to, to society, whether it's public good or not. I've always said I trust the majority of the residents. I definitely trust the majority of you as you make these decisions. I think uh, the majority is a, is a pretty safe uh, approach when we look for something reasonable. Right, we want a reasonable standard. There are lots of requests made, as uh, Dave Monk pointed out. Some will be simple, some will be quick, but maybe we do need to stay absolutely consistent. As our city attorney pointed out, that either it's free or it's not, and it seems to make sense. Most people would say, yeah, we probably need to charge, right, no matter what's going to be done. I think also the majority of our residents would say it's a good thing. The grant request is a good thing. It's a protection for us to be able to have open, responsible government and for us to have checks and balances and things. And I think most of us would say that's a, a reasonable thing. I also think most of us would say what's been requested is not reasonable. And I hope that's what you'll assess as you uh, determine whether or not you're going to go forward and, and with these requests and, and either fulfill them or not. I think, um, Last little bit where I was going. Oh, I do appreciate you also keeping us informed on the uh, city newsletter. I've seen this addressed a couple times. I hope you will continue to do that just to let us know where our money is being spent and where your time is being spent. I, uh, I asked something last summer, probably about eight months ago about an ordinance. I'd like teeth to be in the, the drink, the alcohol, the smoking, the, in the parks, you might remember that. And there's going to be some follow-up. Well, you can't put your time into following up on something like that when there's something like this being requested. So, um, appreciate all your efforts. I trust your judgment. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Fila. Am I pronouncing your name last name right? Yeah. Uh, my name is Joe Fila. I had two things I would like to talk about tonight. First of all, I live at 4018 West Cypress. Uh, I've been a resident of Cedar Hills for 10 years. We as residents have elected you to run the city in a prudent, wise manner. You sacrifice your personal and family time to make our community a better place. I personally believe that you have done what you believe to be best for our city, and I thank you for that. Your job includes making decisions for all of us. These, these decisions at times are difficult and, and controversial, to say the least. Your friendships with your neighbors and others may be strained or even destroyed due to your decisions you make as public servants. Don't let this deter you from making what you feel to be the best decision for our community. We elected you because we believe you were the best person to, to represent us. Tonight, I'm asking you to consider two, two requests. First, is the commercial development south of Walmart. I have read the city council minutes and have looked over the blueprints with regards to, me, to this proposal. I know some residents who live close in close proximity to this proposed development have voiced their concerns. The developer, in turn, has been willing to make adjustments in an attempt to accommodate these concerns. I ask that you approve this development. I believe it is a positive addition to our city and will jumpstart additional commercial activity around it. In addition to sales tax and property tax revenue uh, generated by these businesses that will contribute to a stronger financial position for the city and will better enable the city to meet its financial obligations. My second request goes with the grammar request. As a citizen, I value my ability to petition my government for public records. I also realize as a taxpayer that excessive grammar requests become a financial burden on all residents. Therefore, a balance needs to be found. I recommend the following. Each household in the city be given, be given three, three grammar requests per year. Each household is allocated up to an hour of city staff time to fulfill these three requests.